Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Med School Minutes podcast, where we discuss what it takes to attend and successfully complete a medical program. This show is brought to you by St. James School of Medicine. Here is your host, Kashik Gua. Hello, hello, and welcome to the first ever episode of Med School Minutes, where we talk about everything MD with the focus on Caribbean students um, and in IMGs in general. So today we are going to be talking about uh, the USMLE Step 1 and the changes to this. And because and for that, I actually have a fantastic guest, Dr. Devan Gujarati. Dr. Devan Gujarati is from St. James School of Medicine. He is also the clinical dean of St. James School of Medicine and is board certified in internal medicine. He's also a hospitalist in uh, UNC Johnston, where he started the teaching program and serves as uh, the director of medical education there. He, he's also a part of several committees on, on in the university, and uh, we just wanted to talk to him and get his take on what he thinks these changes mean for students. Welcome, Dr. Gujarati. Hey, thank you, Kaushik. Uh, happy to be here. Happy to be on the inaugural episode. And I think it's an important topic we're going to be talking about today for anybody who's planning on going into medicine. Right. So uh, first step. What is the USMLE? How important has it been in shaping your career? And how pivotal do you think that that exam is? Yeah, I mean, the, the step one in the USMLE is the first of uh, three separate exams that you have to take to get licensed in this country. And so uh, step one particularly uh, holds a lot of weight, uh, used to hold a lot of weight at least. Um, uh, it, was, it was sort of the first big barrier to entry uh, if you wanted to become a resident and train in this country. And so uh, the changes are, are sort of monumental. They've been hinting at this for a while, and, and finally it, it's gone through as of January 22nd of this year. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a huge exam. It, it's it's sort of the worry of all uh, medical students as they're sort of entering into their second and third years uh, because it was such a weighty exam. Uh, and part of that is why they've, uh, at least their reasoning for changing the way that they're doing this exam. So just to get dive into some of the changes that they're suggesting, uh, the USMLE Commission is suggesting, is that the exam has gone from an actual score or giving an actual score, they've gone to just pass and fail, which means that if you pass, you don't really get any additional data. You just said, hey, good job, you passed, move on. Uh, the other is that before the USMLE Commission would allow you to take the USMLE Step 1 up to six times, now they're reduced that to four. I don't necessarily think that that really changes things dramatically for the better students, but it might for students down the road. I mean, students who are probably not uh, as well, but I don't think that that has a material impact. And the this I think is a big change as well, is that before there was no uh, order to the exams. I know, yes, they're numbered. So logically, you would think people take step one before step two. But that's not the that wasn't the case before. They, you could take step two before taking step one. But now the USMLE Commission has made it mandatory to take step one before step two, which is, I think, a, a great thing, a great step. What are your thoughts on this? Like, I mean, um, w what do you think about this whole pass fail, the fact that there's no more numbers? How does that impact residency? How does that uh, you as a uh, practicing physician dealing with students all the time, how does that impact your interactions with the students? Yeah, but I, I think it's going to, well, I'll take a step back. I think the rationale of, of the board members is sound. And I think I've changed my position on this since, since news of this first came out. You know, initially, it didn't really make sense to me because all you're really doing is is shifting uh, the weight of the exam from the first step, which is USMLE step one, to the second step, which is step two, CK, uh, which is more sort of clinically based. But at, at the end of it, their, their reasoning for themselves at least is sound. They, they're finding that a lot of students would uh, not pay attention to their actual medical school studies and really focus on step one. Um, people were not showing up to class. People weren't putting in the effort to learn the material in their second year of medical school because they were just so focused on doing well on this exam because it was it was such a uh, important step in getting your foot in the door, especially if you wanted to do a competitive residency. 
Um, and so in that respect, I think, I think the reasoning is sound. It, it does take a little bit of the pressure off to get a very high score on step one. Um, and I've also sort of changed my thinking on, on what it means for IMGs, you know, and it's because of this is that IMGs were taking step two CK and, and really putting a lot of focus on it before they were applying to residency anyway. So uh, I don't know that it changes that. I'm, I'm hoping that their reasoning sort of works out the way it's supposed to in reducing some of the burden um, on, on second year medical students to prepare for this exam and, and get into their clinical rotations and not have it be such a overbearing thing going through their second year. Um, but at the end of the day, you are shifting the weight of what uh, residency programs are going to look at and program directors are going to look at where they like objective data. They're going to like having a score. You know, a pass fail is great, but they're going to want to see how people do, how students do on step two CK. Um, which is going to now carry the weight. And so more people will likely be taking it. And again, you're, you're shifting the burden of um, stress and, and sort of preparation to that exam now over step one. Uh, again, it's more clinically based. It's not as much basic sciences, biochemistry um, as step one is. And so uh, I think I think maybe this will actually benefit students. I don't, I don't think it's going to um, cause much trouble. And again, particularly for IMGs, they were doing this anyway. So do you think being a, a clinical practitioner and and um, since you deal with so many clinical students, do you think the quality of students is going to go down that you're going to see in UNC or uh, even at St. James? Do you think that that will be affected at all? Honestly, I don't think so. I mean, you know, test. I, I teach my students that you have to study for practical medicine very differently than you study for tests. You know, there's test taking strategies and, and the practice that you do for taking tests should be very different than what you do for your day to day clinical work. And so those two things that I teach them to do in parallel, where they're studying for tests and learning test taking skills and doing questions um, to prepare themselves for taking a board exam at the same time as in parallel doing the reading and, and the study that it takes to actually take care of real people. And so in that respect, I don't expect the quality of students to change. You know, these are to some degree, these are aptitude tests and these kids have already made it into med school. They've presumably already made it through year one and year two of medical school successfully. And so I, I don't know that it changes the quality of students. Uh, again, uh, my hope is that this bears out the way the board is thinking about it in that we'll spend more time in year two, spending time in the classroom, spending time really learning the base material that it takes to be a good doctor, you know, and so that you can apply that once you get out into the clinical world and, and are doing rotations in, in third and fourth year. Um, and so I'm hoping it bears out. Again, I, I really don't think it's going to affect the quality of students. All right. So some of the reasoning that the U.S. Assembly Management Committee or the U.S. Assembly Commission has given for this change is, number one, to reduce stress, number two, to increase diversity, um, number three, to uh, some something on the lines of what you mentioned, it kind of distracts from uh, developing critical skills such as communication and teamwork if they're focusing too much on the test um, and have increased focus in clinical skills and then to make future doctors better around it. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, for reducing stress, I know you've mentioned that several times, but does that really reduce stress? Because we also have, we also know that the National Board of Medical Examiners has released a notice saying that the passing rate has, or the passing point has gone up by two uh, two points. So I believe uh, before it was 194 uh, on a scored test. And based on what we've heard from the NBME, it's going to be 196. So obviously they're making the test harder. How is that really going to reduce stress though? Yeah, I, mean, I think your point is well taken in that there, we're, we're so trained and, and our psychology is so set up uh, in the way that people who get into medical school in the first place sort of are psychologically wired to just get a good high score every time. I think this changes the mentality on that. Um, I think the only place that that I think this 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 idea of stress sort of takes place is, again, in people who are just they do well on tests and they want the highest score possible. I think it, it eliminates that a little bit. And I don't, I guess I see it from two ways. On the one hand, I don't want people who, to think that they have to study any less hard for this test because again, it, it is 
failing this test is still going to be a problem, right? If you if you fail the step one, that puts you in a very different bucket than than if you pass it the first time, even with a numerical score. Um, but again, I think it levels the playing field a little bit because again, step one is not. I don't think it's indicative, and I don't know that it's ever been indicative to say that if you do well on step one, you're going to be a good doctor. You know, that that means a lot of things, but. I don't think there's ever been a one-to-one -one correlation to say that, hey, if you score in the 95th percentile on step one, you're clearly going to be a fantastic doctor. You know, I, I think it means you're really good at taking tests. And so um, in that respect, I, my hope is that people don't decide that they're going to slack in studying for this thing because it's pass-fail. Because, again, okay. uh, getting a low score used to be a problem, but now failing this test could be a, a huge problem, even though you can take it four times. Okay. So – Earlier, you mentioned that, you know, uh, program directors like to be objective and uh, make concrete decisions based on numbers. Now that that's gone away, and one of the uh, reasonings for the U.S. Army Management com uh, Committee is that it increases diversity. Do you think that that's true, or you think the U.S. Uh, Managing Committee is just sitting on an ivory tower without any uh, contact with the ground reality? Well, what, do you, what, do you, what is your take on that? I don't know that I buy the diversity argument. I mean, again, people going into medicine are, it's a fairly diverse bunch to start with. Uh, maybe they're talking about the diversity of people who are in higher end specialties. But again, I don't think this idea of an objective score has gone away. I think we've just shifted it from step one to more people taking step two. I mean, if you think about if you're a program director for a residency in this country, you're getting thousands of applications for X number of residency positions that you have. And it doesn't take much to put in a filter on these these applications to say, okay, well, I want somebody before it was with step one, I want somebody who's got a score of 220 or above or whatever the number happens to be for that position or that program. Now they're just going to shift that to step two. They're going to say, well, I want a score of 220 or above in step two rather than step one. And step two is potentially a much better gauge of if you're going to be a good clinician or not, just because it's, it's more clinically based. Um, so I, I don't really know that that's gone away. I, I just I think you're going to see more, especially U.S. students uh, focusing on step two CK. And I, again, my impression's always been that IMGs have have put in a good amount of focus on step two CK. Uh, and so I think in that respect, it doesn't change. Um, it and, and again, I don't really buy the diversity argument in all this. Okay. So, um, but when when you're a program director. Uh, now, obviously, you don't have any scores for step one. You just have the score for step two. So step two obviously becomes far more critical now. Before, I, I've I've seen students who haven't necessarily done really well on step two, but have knocked it out of the park in step one, match into really good and prestigious programs. Does that mean that if you... Uh, I mean, it's almost like the USMLE uh, Management Committee has reduced the opportunities for students to redeem themselves. Is this a good way of looking at it? I don't know. I mean, again, I think an objective score is an objective score. I think, you know, it, it did put people into a different echelon of what they were competitive for if they had a high step one and step two score before. Mm -hmm. I think now the focus just moves to, again, your step two score and the rest of your CV. And I, I mean, again, we, we want students and people who are going to become residents and then go on to be attendings to be, one, reasonable people, but also have uh, a good background in whatever it is they're doing. And so, you know, I think this puts a lot more focus on your the entirety of your CV. And so whether okay. it's research experience, volunteering, um, obviously the grades you've gotten in, in medical school, I think um, uh, letters from your preceptors gain even more value than they were before. They, I, I thought they were very val valuable before uh, this change, and I think they're going to carry even more weight. Uh, again, my hope is that these changes make program directors sort of broaden their scope and look at candidates in a more holistic way. I, th I think the lip service has been that they've been doing that for some time, and, and I think some programs have done that. But I think it's going to put more weight on people who are really focused and, and dedicated to wanting to be in medicine, to really building up an application that really shows that they've done the work and have a genuine interest in doing things. You know, again, a, a high step one score might help you gloss over some of the weaknesses on your application. I think this change just makes it more important that 
you do the things that you need to to strengthen your entire CV and your entire application um, to make up for any other deficiency. And not having a step one score, potentially for IMGs, you know, it, it's one less data point that you can use to show that you're a strong applicant. Um, just having a pass fail rather than having a really high score on step one as well as step two. So, I mean, intuitively, like when I heard about this, my first reaction was, you know, if you're an IMG, you just have to work so much harder. Is that true? Or is do you think that whatever IMGs tend to do, because I personally think IMGs tend to be much better rounded because they know they have an, a, a harder task than like a U.S. medical school graduate. Uh, so they do a lot more to, uh, to distinguish themselves. Uh, like, for example, at St. James, uh, they they organize uh, healthcare clinics. They're 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 helping the local population um, with their uh, various needs, and and so they they get s s some more patient exposure, and they have a lot more leadership opportunities. Uh, do you think that IMGs have to do anything differently when they're going down this road? If someone's in the th second year of med school now and about to take the step one. Do you think that they need to take a step back, switch gears a little bit and be like, oh, hey, you know what? I'm just going to go uh, volunteer with the Red Cross for a little bit more than I normally would have. Do you think that they have to change any perspective uh, for the exam, for their entire application process, for their entire career now? I mean, again, in an ideal world, I don't, I don't want them to change that focus. I think they they okay. have to have that focus, you know, in, in doing other things that show that this is really something you want to do and that you're dedicated and focused to having a career in medicine. I mean, that's always, uh, again, the step one score especially was there to get you in the door. You know, what you did once you got in the door was still based on your CV. Your, your step one score got you to the interview. Once you got to the interview, it's everything else. And so, you know, I, I think, again, that that becomes doubly valuable that you can speak intelligently and passionately about things that are important to you. So if you worked in a clinic, but you just went because you had to once a week and didn't really do much, of, you know, that didn't bear any weight before and it's not going to bear any weight now. It's very different than, hey, I went to clinic, you know, I, I was taking care of my patients. I saw this need and, and I did this project to address it. Um, I was able to uh, involve myself and, and passionately pursue this thing that's very important to me, when you can speak intelligently about those kinds of things and show that you actually took uh, a lot of effort and, and did something passionately, that always speaks to program directors. You know, a residency, uh, at the end of the day, the program director is hiring somebody that's going to work for them. And so they want somebody who's self-sufficient, who clearly is passionate and wants to learn, is a self-starter. All the things that you can do to show that and then talk about it um, in an intelligent way and, and in a way that shows that you've developed some depth of experience uh, was always helpful. And again, I think that is still going to be helpful. Uh, you know, again, you're losing a data point and, and that I, I think what it's going to do is is hurt the folks that were really good test takers and, and potentially also very bright that where they had a very high step one score. Um, I think those are the really the only people that this this change is going to hurt is where they were sort of going to have two excellent data points to go off of before. But again, those same students are generally also very good at all these other things. And so I don't really think that the, the, uh, the benefit that the vast majority of IMGs are going to get that who, who don't do as well on tests are going to get is, is harmed as much by sort of not having a great data point for the students that were going to excel at the step one. Um, and so, again, I think it behooves IMGs especially to really focus on on doing everything they can to um, really build up their CV and their resume, you know, before it gets to interview season, whether it's doing CME courses, a lot of which are free in, you know, I know where St. James rotates, a lot of the universities there offer it free to trainees, uh, really, you know, diving in and really getting a deep understanding of, of uh, different fields of medicine as well as things like quality projects, uh, research. And so really getting involved in those things, again, in my opinion, has always been helpful. And I think it becomes doubly more so now. Okay. Well, I mean, that's really good to know. So the other interesting thing is that um, the USM and the uh, Management Committee has said that they want the future doctors, they've made this change because they want the future doctors to be well-rounded. 
I always thought doctors were pretty well rounded. Like, what's what's what exactly is lacking here with the, with doctors? Are they not communicating properly with uh, physicians? I mean, do you see that like you know a lot of doctors coming out are lacking in a particular aspect of communication, empathy, uh, general knowledge? I mean, why do doctors even need to be well rounded? I mean, again, a, a doctor is just a—it's a career. I mean, so mm-hmm. you have you have folks from all different backgrounds and and uh, different experiences of life coming into it. Uh, I think, in general, the knock—you know—the knock has been that there there's definitely uh, subpopulations of physicians who are not very good at communicating. And part of it's just that you have to be hyper focused to become a physician in this country. It's yeah. it's something that you have to sort of make your mind up about fairly early on, dedicate yourself to studies. There's the, and, and because of that, you miss out on stuff. There's an opportunity cost to becoming a physician. You know, there's your friends may be going out and, and socializing, whereas you're staying home to study for your MCAT or step one or what have you. Uh, you know, your friends have the weekend off, but you're on call because you're on your surgery rotation or whatever it may be. And so, uh, you know, there's definitely things that, that um, people who are training to become physicians miss out on that you know, other populations of students who are pursuing other careers get to do. And so that that may change the way uh, you evolve socially or the way you learn how to communicate. And, and again, talking to patients and, and dealing with the hierarchy of medicine is also very different than in, in other specialties. And so I think all that plays a role in the personalities of people who become physicians. Uh, my hope is, again, that Again, I'm sort of on both sides of this. Taking away the stress of step one sure may help people build more social bridges and spend time doing other things because they're not um, having to study as much or focus as much on step two during second year and and are sort of more engaged in their classrooms and and clinical experiences than they would be otherwise. Um, But again, some of this starts a lot sooner than that. You know, people who who are sure they want to do medicine may decide in high school and and so they're the, the way they sort of manage their time and activities they participate in um may be um changed from a much earlier age than when they're sticking thinking about step one and so uh it's sort of tough to say i i think i think if that's a reasoning for their for their change then potentially it's good reasoning but i think there's there's more work to do behind the scenes than just this one change um, so one other thing that has been playing on my mind is that, uh, you know, a, a lot of you can go through an MD without taking the MCAT. Do you think the fact that they are not focusing on step one scores uh, makes the MCATs more more um, important? Or do you think program directors might be in a situation? Like, oh, hey, let me tell me about this test that you took, like four years ago or five years ago uh, and how you scored. And would, do you think that that would become a criteria where uh, program directors are? Yeah, I don't, I don't really see that happening. I don't know that they're going to go back to the MCAT. You know, I think uh, the one thing weird thing about medicine that I I think lay people don't think about is it's a lot of test taking, you know, Mm -hmm. to get through uh, college pre-med courses, the MCAT, um, you know, exams in medical school, that's, that's a lot of testing, you know, all those testing is, it's not just a understanding of clinical knowledge and physiology and, and the background of medicine, but are you a good test taker or not? You know, that, that plays a large role in uh, who gets to do what uh, once they're applying to residencies and, and those sorts of things. And so I think we take enough tests where, you know, if you've been a good student, you've had good grades, your, your shelf exams and your clinical rotations have gone well, um, and you've done uh, well on step two, uh, I think that's enough data points for program directors to say, okay, well, this person is most likely to pass their you know, licensing board exams moving forward, like your step three, and then whatever subspecialty board exams you're taking um, afterwards to get certified. Uh, I don't know that the MCAT's really going to play a role in that. I mean, again, most medical schools, uh, obviously in the U.S., all medical schools require the MCAT, and there's there's definitely Caribbean schools that don't uh, place as much emphasis on it, but the amount of testing you do between your first year of medical school and your last year really should make up for that. And I think, again, part of the CV that that program directors will probably spend more time analyzing is what were your grades? 
how'd you do in basic sciences in, in the first two years of medical school? Did you have deficiencies there? I think that's a much more telling um, bit of information that they have at their disposal than, you know, trying to figure out what somebody's MCAT score was. All right. So to conclude everything, to conclude our discussion, you gave us a lot of information and a lot of fantastic tips. What would you consider this change? Would you consider it to be a positive change or a negative change when it comes to IMGs, especially Caribbean students? I think on the whole, just because of the way Caribbean students, again, generally operate where they're taking step two CK before they apply to residencies and submitting that score is that I, I think the net effect is going to be essentially zero. I think, okay. again, some of the some of the high flyers who are going to get 95 plus percentile on step one may be harmed a little bit. But again, my feeling is those students have are, are the top of the heap already in doing things outside of school that's going to boost their resume they're they're doing research they're reading they're going to cme conferences they're making those connections on the whole obviously that doesn't apply to everybody and so i i think whatever harm they suffer from not having an excellent data point from step one is going to be made up for with step two and is going to be made up for by this by their entirety of their resume and application i think the folks that this really helps is a bigger slice of the img population that potentially aren't great test takers, you know, and they may have had a lower score on step one, which then, uh, you know, changes their trajectory of what they may have wanted to do. Um, and in general, people do better on CK than they did on, on step one mm -hmm. anyway, if you just look at the average scores uh, for everybody. And so I, I think this is going to be a net gain for IMGs, even though it, it, I think on the surface of it, everybody's reaction was what my initial reaction was, is, oh, this is, they're doing this to hurt IMGs because IMGs try to score well on step one. I think net net, it, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a boon to IMGs. I think, again, they can focus more on their clinical rotations. They can focus on doing better in their uh, grades and, and classes for, for second year of medical school and really not spend the amount of time and effort in trying to blow step one out of the water. You know, Again, I saw this when I was in medical school at St. James where people had their USMLE books and stacks of, of books and videos and uh, were already worried about which um, exam prep course they're going to take before we even started classes first year, you know, and my hope is that, again, some of this gets absolved and they just focus on being really, really good students and really learning the material for the okay. entirety of medicine rather than just focusing on a test. Oh, well, that's really good advice. So essentially, it seems like the net effect um, is, you know, going to be zero. They shouldn't change their, the way they approach uh, their education at all. But at the same time, there might be some uh, along the way intangible benefits for this particular change. That's, that's really great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gujarati. We really appreciate your time. You gave us some amazing uh, feedback and uh, viewpoints on this change and how it might affect students. Again, we really appreciate the time. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, and, uh, you know, till next time. Thank you. Thanks again. Uh, yeah. good luck to everybody out there. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning into our show. We hope you enjoyed another episode of med school minutes. If you like our content, please follow us and receive notification when a new show is posted. This podcast is brought to you by St. James school of medicine for a video version of this podcast please check us out on sjsm.org slash video.